friends, thank thank you. Uh, thanks for making the time. Thanks for joining uh, me tonight. I'm Joe Fortune. I'm the Cooperative Party's General Secretary. Um, tonight we've got a, a, a fantastic guest with us uh, speaking within this series of Cooperation Live. We'll, we'll come to uh, Luke Pollard, who's Labour and Cooperative uh, Member of Parliament for Plymouth, Sutton and Devonport. He's the Shadow uh, DEFRA, uh, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, Secretary of State. We we'll look forward to hearing from, from Luke uh, on all of the most relevant aspects of, of his brief within this uh, current uh, uh, national crisis that we find ourselves. And uh, Luke will be looking beyond as well in, in some of the most relevant aspects of the brief. Look, really appreciate you making the time. Um, there are There is just a couple of bits of housekeeping that I'll run through just before uh, we get uh, hear from Luke, because as you know, for people who have been on these calls before with the Cooperative Party, we'll hear from our speaker, but we'll also have time uh, to ensure that we have questions, answers, discussion, uh, following on from, from Luke. Uh, there are three things just to bear in mind in terms of, uh, in terms of those uh, Q&A. Um, the first is that today our Zoom will be being recorded um, and that means that our, our, our members are able, who aren't able to uh, join us live here today, will be able to get this information, get the content on our YouTube channel as well. So if you don't want your, uh, your image to appear uh, through this call, do feel free to turn the camera off. Uh, but just to give you that, that heads up that that's something that we do to all of our uh, Zoom uh, uh, cooperation live calls. Uh, the second bit, just in terms of the, 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 the Q&A, is that what we'll do is we will make sure that the speakers uh, are, are all unmuted at the, at the right point, myself and Izzy, uh, other cooperative of colleagues on the, on the call will be doing that. Through that period though, we will keep everyone else mute just so that we can make sure that we can absolutely have a clarity of call, really uh, allow Luke to get across what he needs to, to speak to us today as, as cooperators. Uh, so when you ask your question, you will be unmuted by, by ourselves. Um, also, there are a couple of other ways of just asking your question. Feel free to pop your question into the chat, uh, the chat function at the bottom of your, 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 your laptop or your, your phone, however you're accessing us today, and that will be passed to myself. And equally, if you do fancy emailing the question through, again, that will get through to me. So do feel free to e email any questions at events at party.coop as well. So that's events at party.coop. Look, other than that, it's, uh, it, it's a, as I say, we're, we're here to, to hear from Luke. The brief that Luke has is one, a hugely wide ranging one. It, you know, covers uh, food and all of its, uh, in all of its ways, you know, food supply, biodiversity, water, air quality, uh, farming, indeed issues such as uh, free school meals as well. Some of the issues which have been front and center of uh, aspects of this national crisis. So I'm really happy to, uh, have this opportunity uh, to, to hear from Luke, who's been uh, working with the minister, but also providing scrutiny where necessary as well. Uh, so we'll hear about that work, but we'll also, as I say, hear a little bit about uh, it looking into the future as well. On that note, I am going to hand over to Luke. Luke, thanks very much for joining us. If you give us that sense, and I'll, I'll uh, manage the Q&A after as well. Thank you, Luke. That's great. Thank you very much, Joe. And uh, welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many... Uh, so many faces from right across the country and good to see that they, we've got a good southwest contingent joining today as well. Uh, behind me is not uh, the beautiful Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Ho, although I thought I'd share a nice sunny warm image with you so you can see what Plymouth would look like uh, if it weren't slightly grey and overcast as it is today. Um, uh, it's been very weird Uh, very weird thinking I'm now in the shadow cabinet because uh, I was speaking to Joe earlier and he reminded me that I uh, used to work in a co-op and he's certainly true and back in the days when I had brown hair rather than the grey tinges that you see I worked on a meat counter in my local co-op and it seemed that the big issues that were affecting us were a million miles away. Uh, it felt sometimes that you were able to have agency and uh, and the ability to change that. And that is something that I didn't really like very much. And it is through us coming together, working together, we can achieve some of that change. And I think when we're looking at the really big challenges that are facing us as a country at the moment, we won't be able to achieve uh, any change, any positive outcomes from those unless we are working together. 
And I think you know none of us need uh, reminding of those really big challenges. But if you just look at what's happening with the coronavirus, if you're looking at what's happening with a climate emergency, if you're looking at the international pressures of globalization, of power and wealth moving from one side of our planet to another, if you're looking at the pressures around automation, if you're looking about the structural inequality in our society, if you're looking at the fact that we can call anyone around the world on our phones, but sometimes we don't know our neighbours, it seems that there's an awful lot of really big challenges. And for me, the lesson I take from that is that each and every one of us needs to play a part in the solution. Each and every one of us needs to have a role. And that's partly why I'm Labour, that's partly why I'm cooperative. Um, uh, some of you will know Plymouth and you'll know that uh, we come from, you know, our city has an incredible cooperative heritage. And for me, that cooperative heritage has taught me that actually we can be radical. We can be radical, we can want to change the world, and we can do that by adhering to decent values, decent uh, appreciation of how you do business in a better way, and making sure that everyone can have a say in it. Now, sometimes within our labour movement, uh, there's a great fascination about where people sit in the party. And for me, I sit somewhere in the middle, in the radical centre. I've watched in the West Country, the left and the right throw stones at each other for far too long. But for me, the solutions that we need to our problems that we face in 2020 will not be found in uh, reheating 1970s socialism, nor will they be found in microwaving 1997 Blairism. We need to find a new path that's suitable for the issues that we face today for our context. We need to find a type of politics that recognises the internet exists, that recognises that globalization and the climate emergency are, are, are real and very pressing. And we need to define that new politics. And for me, that is the opportunity that I think our movement has in the next few months to really uh, to set a new course. And you know, I'm really pleased that Keir Starmer has asked me to uh, carry on in my role as Shadow Environment Secretary. Uh, some of you will know that uh, I replaced uh, the brilliant Sue Heyman, uh, who was the uh, Shadow Environment Secretary up until the general election. Sadly, in the Shadow DEFRA team, we lost five of our six MPs in that election, which included, uh, some of you will know, uh, David Drew, who is an incredibly strong cooperative uh, champion on food issues and farming for some time. Um, I really wish I hadn't been promoted in that context, but for me, the, the opportunity to serve in the Shadow Cabinet under Jeremy First, now under Keir, means that you know the passion, the values that I feel really strongly about, um, about being red on the outside, really proudly Labour, and green on the inside, making sure everything we do is sustainable, has to be front and centre of where we are. Um, and if you remember back, I'll take you back a whole year, a year and, and uh, a year and a day, in fact, a year and a day ago, in Parliament, Labour MPs uh, forced the uh, government, forced Parliament, to declare a climate emergency. Now, that was only a year ago. Now, enormous amounts has changed during that time. And if you think about some of the issues around the environment and sustainability that we were talking about a year ago, sadly, some of those were regarded as um, important but technical. They were put on the periphery of the policy debate. They weren't always front and center. If you fast forward a year on, those issues around food, those issues around the air we breathe, the issues around you know the very basic building blocks of our society are now front and center you know the lack of food the uh, empty shelves the panic buying uh, the concerns around crops rotting in the field i think has moved food issues to uh, the top of the political agenda now the cooperative party has been talking about food issues for a great many years the availability of uh, uh, of nutritious decent food at affordable prices is actually you know if you cast your mind back to your history books, that's why the cooperative movement was started. That's where the Rochdale pioneers found their anger that to put that into a new form of organisation. But we need to reflect on that for where we are now. You know, the figures that came out last week about food bank usage, that saw 60 to 80% increase on average in food banks, 10% of food banks in our country reporting a 200% increase in food banks, 1.8 million people now being moved onto universal credit. The issues about food poverty can no longer be dismissed by those on the right as something affecting only a minority on the edge. It is a mainstream problem. Food poverty is a mainstream political issue that Labour, the cooperative movement, has been addressing for some time, but we now need the government to address. 
The concerns that I have and the, those in the Shadow DEFRA team about the government's response on food issues, I think has tallied with some of the concerns I have about the ideology of the government. That it's all too frequently a, a nudge philosophy, a, a passive philosophy that relies on the market to provide a solution. Well, the market doesn't provide solutions when it comes to those people in food poverty at the moment. The market's not providing a solution for people who are being shielded, who are unable to access uh, food in the way that they were previously. The market is uh, suffering a market failure when it comes to agricultural labour supply for our crops rotting in a field because there's not enough people trained and available to pick it. Now, this shows that what we need to do around food uh, needs to change. And I want to see that uh, food issues at the top of the political agenda, not be just because there's a crisis, but because there's an opportunity to change, to make this fairer and better. Um, next week in the House of Commons, uh, we probably will have our first opportunity to use the online voting system when the agriculture bill returns on Wednesday. Um, this uh, is a piece of legislation that uh, is good for reading just before you go to bed, uh, if you want to fall asleep, because it's a very technical piece of legislation but it's very important. It moves our entire farming system as a country from one that relied, that was built around the EU subsidies to one that changes that to public money for public goods. That says you'll be rewarded, not necessarily for the uh, production of food, but for your environmental stewardship, for how you look after your landscapes. And that is welcome and positive. And it's something that I'd like to see the European Union move to as they look at reforming the common agricultural policy in the future as well. But it also highlights that there's a food shaped hole in that policy area, that there is real issues around the availability of nutritious food, not just for those people that were in food poverty before the crisis, but for those people that are in food poverty since, for those people that are being shielded and are being given angel delight and undiluted orange juice as, as part of their food parcels and not much besides. It shows that there's a real issue in terms of the affordability of food as well. Now food in the UK is at a historic low in terms of relative pricing, but it's still too expensive for far too many people. And the issues around food um, point directly to the wider issues around poverty that we're in. It's one of the reasons that uh, when we first started as a new shadow cabinet under Keir's leadership, the, the initial response to the increase in food bank uses was a DEFRA response because it was a food issue. But actually this is a a DWP issue, a work and pensions, a treasury issue, because it's not about the food per se. There is enough food in our entire country to feed everyone who is hungry. It's a poverty issue. It's an issue about people not being able to afford to feed themselves. It's an issue about people, especially those in our poorest communities, buying some of our worst quality food. And for me, if you take a step back from where we are, and if you look at the wider environmental challenges that we have, where that's about food and farming, where that's about air quality, fishing, uh, or other environmental issues besides, we have to apply our values and our filter to it. So for me, we need to make sure that environmental justice and social justice goes hand in hand. Because whether you're looking about whether people can afford good quality food for themselves and their family, whether you're looking about the rise in obesity, whether you're looking at the fact that if you live in a poorer community, you're more likely to be affected by poorer air quality. If you live in a richer community, you're more likely to have better air quality. Social justice and environmental justice are two sides of the same, are absolutely uh, two sides of the same coin. And that's why we need to have those approaches that are welded together. Because for me, even though the way the government sets up environmental policy with a Department for Business leading on carbon, and DEFRA leading on food, air, water. Regardless of that administrative function, there is a real disconnect here because it can't be right that the people who can afford to decarbonize the most, the people who can afford to get the healthiest food are those with money. And those people that can afford to do that the least, that have the least amount of agency are the poorest. We're not gonna hit a net zero target of 2050, 2030, or any other date, if we don't create the measures where every single person, every single family in our country has not only the agency, the ability to enact that change, but the opportunity to do so in an affordable way. 
So when we talk about the, the, the urgent need to reform our, our, the way the food system works, when we talk about the need to get rid of diesel and petrol cars from our roads, to have a massive expansion of electric, hydrogen and other forms of uh, propulsion, we need to make sure that we're taking communities with, with us. Because one of the lessons that I learned from the really pretty grim election results in December last year was that frequently our arguments around the environment were powerful, visionary, bold. The Green New Deal, the net zero target date by 2030, our tree planting targets, you know, things that would make a transformative and positive change. But not everyone believed us. Not everyone thought that they were positive. If you are living in a, in a rented property and driving a van to get to your job, working two jobs where that is your entire family income and you're struggling, the idea of not being able to drive your diesel van because Labour were going to stop you was an impediment to voting Labour. And that's a tough pill for us to swallow because I imagine many of you are on this call because you care about the environment. You're part of the cooperative movement because you believe in a better way of doing politics, a better society. Now, many of you are probably Labour members as well, and you've been banging on doors doing it because you know all of this makes a difference to people. But we have to reframe and recast some of that environmental debate if we are to win people over. And that is really important because I want to see us have a radical and bold set of environmental policies, not just simply located in DEFRA and a little bit over in Bayes and a value that stems across our international aid and our trade things. But when you cut across every single labour policy, I want it to have a green edge. I want it to be sustainable. I want it to have considered what the environmental consequences are, what the carbon consequences are, what the water consequences are, what the social justice consequences are of that environmental policy. Because if we don't have that, we're going to be failing in our, 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 our duty to provide bold radical policies, but we're also going to be failing an electoral test because people won't vote for policies that they don't see that they have a part to play in, that they won't, uh, that they don't have a role in, that they don't see uh, something where they, uh, their livelihoods, their family livelihoods can be supported. Now, in the next uh, few months or so, now Ed Miliband, who leads on Labour's carbon agenda, will, will be setting out very bold policies around carbon and around our participation in COP26, uh, which is probably the biggest conference that up until a few months ago, probably no one had heard of. That's the uh, Conference of the Parties, the UN Global Conference that uh, would have been held in Glasgow in November this year to set the new global framework for carbon reduction and how we do that as a, as a planet that replaces and builds on the Paris commitments. Well, that conference has been delayed a year by the virus. And we need to use that one year postponement, not to dither, not to delay, not to reprioritize onto other areas, but to recognize that those countries, those communities that are able to better organize, uh, create green jobs, uh, support their uh, local environment will be the countries that benefit and emerge stronger from the virus uh, than those that choose to cling to a fossil fuel past. And you might have had this uh, over the past few days or so. I've seen people in Plymouth uh, say to me, you hear the birds more now, don't you? You might, have, you might have found yourself saying that. You know, you recognise that there's a greater involvement of wildlife in the community. Well, that will be the case. With fewer diesel and petrol cars on the road, with fewer engines, that ambient hum of urban infrastructure, we're able to hear, we're able to interact with our wildlife and our settings around us so much more. And for me, when you're talking about what, the, what we need to do to emerge from the virus, what kind of world we want to go into, it's sometimes tempting to use the language of, I want it to go back to normal. But you and I both know that there is no normal. We can't go back to normal because normal wasn't working. It wasn't working for the people in food hunger. It wasn't working for the kids growing up uh, alongside roads where they couldn't afford to breathe. It wasn't working for the pensioners that can't leave their house because they can't breathe and take steps to do so. It wasn't working because there's far too many of our fellow citizens in poverty. So we've got to leave the virus. We've got to emerge from the virus and aspire to a better place. And that message of hope, that message of uh, of getting to a better, uh, better position for our country has to have environmental and social justice wedded together. Because we only have just over 10 years to 
uh, reverse um, to prevent irreversible uh, climate change. The temperature rise of over 2% that would see the ice caps uh, melt to a point that sea levels would rise, that would flood large parts of our country, that would fundamentally change our weather patterns, that would see more extreme weather happening more frequently and more often. Now, all those things are decided upon in the next 10 years, and they'll be decided upon about how we act, what decisions we take now. And it, it you know, depresses me and gets me angry that we weren't able to put in place our manifesto from the last general election, because I know that the next five years of conservative environmental policies will be years wasted, will be years where we could have been going faster, where we could have been making sure that it's not just the affluent that are decarbonizing, are taking steps to live in more affordable, uh, greener homes. Because we didn't win, we've lost that opportunity, which means that for the next four years that are left, we need to not only have a radical policy, that helps us emerge from the virus in a, 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 into a better future, a better greener future. But we need to make sure that we're supporting where Labour is in power, and in particular, in local government. And that is where the Cooperative Party is strong and is growing. And I, I look around, the, uh, I look around the, uh, the, the little faces that are staring back, desperately hoping that they don't get picked out in the comments that I'm just about to make. And I can see that there are brilliant Labour and cooperative councillors uh, on the screen. I can see that the work that you're doing in your communities and, um, you know, uh, that work is where we're going to need to be because, you know, the frustration for me for the next four years, if I'm still the Shadow Environment Secretary the day before the next general election, I will have had zero executive time to introduce the policies that we need. But looking at the Labour and cooperative councillors we have on the call, well, you will have had hopefully many, many years to put in place those radical policies that we need. And actually, if you look across the labor movement about where the radical policies, environmental, food justice, air quality are coming from, well, they're coming from the cooperative councils. They're coming from people that are on this call. And for me, one of the things that I've been quite vocal about in my time, uh, much to be a thorn in the side of Joe and some of his uh, uh, cooperative uh, general secretary colleagues in the past, was I want to see cooperative values not just as a very worthy, very genuine and heartfelt, well-meaning periphery. I want to see our values mainstreamed. I want us to apply tests to say, why can't that policy be cooperative? Why can't we uh, devolve power and responsibilities? And if we are looking at the challenges that we face with globalization, with the climate emergency, with the virus, with food poverty, then many of those solutions will be local they will be driven by communities. We'll have to empower communities and do things differently. And that does mean a different approach from government. That does mean a different approach from business. That does mean a different approach from the Labour Party, frankly, about how we do that. And for me, one of the most exciting things that I've seen, without telling tales, because you're not allowed to leak from shadow cabinet, is that we've had Nick Forbes, uh, the leader of the Labour LGA, a uh, councillor in Newcastle on, on our Zoom calls as a shadow cabinet, because um, and this is a bit of a secret as well, MPs don't know everything and they haven't got all the answers, but they're really rubbish at admitting it. And actually to have the voice of local government in those discussions, I think, sets a new course for how our party is going to operate in the future. And that is a positive one because we do need to reset and rethink. You know, our manifesto from the last election, I think, was pretty good, if I'm honest. On environmental measures, it was bold. But there's still things we can do and the virus has fundamentally changed where we are there is no going back to where we were before this virus there is no return to that it wasn't working and it is impossible to get there so the only question now is what direction are we going in where are we going to emerge as a community as a, as a country as a global society and for me front and center of that has to be environmental priorities because if we're not addressing food availability the air we breathe the water we drink, the, the habitats around us, then we are not emerging into a better place. We're emerging into a poorer place. And that for me is something that I don't think is acceptable. And that's why I'm really keen that I use my time in the shadow cabinet uh, to engage with members, to listen to their views, to try and push as radical a policy as we can that takes people with us. Because I don't want that person who drives that diesel van to his two jobs, who worries about paying the bills, to ever think again that Labour's not the natural party for him and his family. I never want again to see people that would have been voting Labour for not doing it. 
And there was an experience that you probably heard, which I'll leave you to as my final thought. Uh, one person said, oh, I'm not voting Labour because they want to get rid of food banks. And that's where I get my food from. And for me, that shows a real challenge for us in terms of how we talk about our policies and how we communicate it. Because if that person who relies on a food bank didn't think that Labour was their natural home, then we're failing. And that is our challenge. And that is how we're going to win power in the future by making sure that our priorities are one and the same of the communities that we're trying to represent, those that we hold and those seats that we need to win back, that we make sure that we're not just an urban party, we're a rural party as well, that we are there turning up, that we're not just a party that will commentate on things, but we're there alongside people with grassroots organisation, with, uh, with local councils and local councillors that are making real difference, that people can see, that we can say, well, that council's pretty good, perhaps I'll give that candidate a go. That's where we need to be. And for me, that is the challenge where we've got, and I'm optimistic about the future. I feel quite positive about the first couple of weeks of Keir's leadership. I think it has been, it's quite easy to uh, shout from the sidelines. The constructive opposition he's presenting is difficult. It's hard, but it's the right thing to do. And I think the approach that he's taken in scrutinising the government in, uh, in providing and uh, asking for clarity about policies that I think are failing, I think is the right approach uh, to making sure that we have the arguments uh, that take people with us and don't see Labour as simply a party of opposition. We need to be a party of government and people need to see that along the way. So uh, that's probably enough for me as an opening, uh, opening gambit. Uh, really keen to hear from you and your questions uh, about uh, everything uh, green in the Labour Party and where cooperative values in particular sit with those. Final thing I just mentioned is that within my team, although we lost David Drew, we do have uh, Lloyd Russell Moyle, who is the Labour and Cooperative Member of Parliament in Brighton, uh, as part of the team. He leads for uh, Labour now on air quality, which is an agenda that I think needs to be brought to the centre, uh, front and centre much more because it's a social justice issue, it's an environmental issue, and it is something that affects each and every one of our communities wherever we are in the United Kingdom. Over to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, th th thanks, Luke. A, a, a fantastic sort of force of, uh, of where we find ourselves in terms of this crisis, the brief and in, in terms of politics more generally as well. R hugely appreciative of it. Uh, rather than a thorn in the si side, Luke, we at the Cooperative Party are hugely proud of, uh, of, of yourself within the shadow uh, role. It's easy to see uh, why uh, you uh, serve both in, in Jeremy Corbyn's cabinet and now in Keir Starmer's as well. Uh, we're hugely proud and appreciative of all the work that you do. Um, look, we do have some questions coming in. We have them coming in on the on the chat function, which you're able uh, to, all people are able to pop their question into there. Also, do feel free to email, as I said, at events at party.coop. And also, uh, make sure you do uh, raise your virtual hand. I can see that we've got uh, three uh, cooperators already doing so. Uh, you can do that by hitting the participants button at the bottom of your screen, and they're, they're coming in thick and fast now. So I'm going to take two at a time for the time being, uh, just to try and get our, ourselves going, Luke, if, if that's OK. Um, the, f the first is on the chat function, and it's come, it's come from Jenny. Uh, it's Jenny Rathbone uh, may well be a comrade and cooperator from Wales. Uh, but uh, Jenny's asking about food standards uh, post any sort of trade deal uh, after this initial crisis with the US. Food and farming standards, Luke, how do we uh, best uh, make sure that we are, are protecting both of those? Um, and equally, I'm just, just before you answer that one, Luke, I'll bring in Caroline, uh, Caroline Richardson, who's had a hand up a virtual hand, mercifully a virtual hand, because otherwise the arm would have been uh, stiff. Uh, Caroline, you, you, you were up early in that. Is it possible to give Luke your question as well? Caroline? Um, hi, um, hi, my name's Caroline. I'm in Cumbria, actually a constituent of Sue Heyman, who previously helped Shadow Brief. I uh, work quite a lot with Sue. I went to agricultural college. We're a very rural and farming community. We have um, a lot of disconnect between the towns and the rural community, um, not in any sort of negative manner, but there is um, a fundamental disconnect in education. Um, things like the diesel van man 
can be addressed when we can talk about electric vehicles uh, with confidence and we can talk about biofuels with confidence. But that's about educating our members, educating our members so we can sell this on the doorstep. Yeah. Um, another thing we wanted to sell was community power. And unfortunately, um, in our area, the Conservatives park their tanks on our lawn at a local government level by uh, we lost local council um, because they were promoting renewable energy and solar energy and community energy. And we were we had a policy of building on a floodplain. Um, so having lost the council, we then lost the seat as well. Um, and I think we need to work very hard on educating people. As I say, I'm a graduate from an agricultural college and we need to work very hard on helping people to sell this message. And that means we have to educate our members. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that, Caroline. Luke, on, on those two. Brilliant. Um, thank you both. Um, so I mentioned the agriculture bill, Jenny, uh, is coming back to Parliament next week. It's the first time that we'll be testing our virtual voting system. Um, and if I'm honest, it's a bit of a surprise that it's coming back because uh, we were mm. expecting the government to be introducing mm. legislation that really wasn't quite controversial during this crisis, where there was a degree of cross-party consensus. But when it comes to the agriculture bill, although I support the move to a greater environmental stewardship, the agriculture bill doesn't deal with food. And in particular, it leaves the door open to US mega farms, the, uh, the agricultural product from the US, uh, undercutting UK farmers. And this is where uh, we have been pretty clear. So um, uh, Labour opposed the agriculture bill at its second reading, which is a pretty bold step, uh, because I won't let through any legislation and encourage Labour MPs to vote for it that, um, that deals with um, uh, that allows in uh, cheap produce that undercuts our farmers that could allow in food that uh, isn't produced the same high animal welfare or environmental consideration. So we voted against that. At committee, Labour's tabled uh, amendments to, uh, to protect our high food standards. Now, uh, each and every time the Tories have voted against those, but they've said that they support those high standards. So you've got both the warm sound bites of ministers saying, well, of course, we support Britain's high standards and we don't intend to reduce those standards. Well, I don't believe, actually, they intend to reduce Britain's high farm standards. Not at the moment. In due course, I think they'll try to. But at the moment, they don't. But they're very happy allowing in cheaply produced US uh, food that would undercut our farmers, that would push the poor, poor quality food to the poorest in society, that would allow for erosion of regulatory standards as farmers say we can't compete with this. And that's simply not acceptable. So on Wednesday, um, I've been speaking to the Chief Whip about it and to Keir, uh, we'll be whipping our MPs to use their first opportunity uh, in the Agriculture Bill to stand side by side with our farmers to say we won't be supporting a bill that allows in um, uh, cheap US produce to undercut our farmers, to erode our farm standards and our animal welfare standards. And actually, there is something that for me, I, a bit of kind of nerdy rural pride coming out of me here, that in the first votes that uh, we have under Keir's leadership, it's going to be on a farming issue, and it's going to be on one that maintains our high standards. Because what I want to see us doing is talk about what kind of country do we want to be? with Brexit, with the virus. Well, do you know what? I want us to be a country that doesn't accept hormone treated beef, that doesn't accept chlorinated chicken, that doesn't accept uh, food produced to such a low animal welfare standard that you have to pour huge amounts of chemicals on it to make it uh, 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 worthy for human consumption. That's not the type of country I want us to live in. And that's what Labour MPs will be arguing for. And I hope uh, that will be a message that we will find solidarity and support for not only from those people in towns and cities, but those people in the countryside as well. And I think, you know, Caroline, that uh, brings us on to, to your question. I know Sue spent a lot of time campaigning with you uh, up in Cumbria, and I'm looking forward to coming to visit, because one thing I want to visit uh, as part of my time here is go to those communities that we lost to listen to uh, people about why they uh, didn't vote Labour. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, Workington and, and the areas around it, you know, the constituency is named after a town within it, but the constituency is huge. Just as so many of our target seats actually are that we have to win back, 
the assumption that frequently is held by those on the left and those sometimes in senior leadership within our party in the past, that we're an urban party and actually those folks in countryside areas aren't for us and they get what they deserve by voting for the Tories. I don't subscribe to that view. For me, we need to turn up. We need to be part of those communities because we already are. If you look at our membership in rural communities, it's pretty high. We need to empower those Labour parties and those communities to organise, to listen, to campaign on those issues, to win back trust. And that's where we can get into a real debate around the difference on offer between the, what the Tories are offering, what Labour's offering. Uh, uh, making sure that actually when it comes to, you know, inserting a, uh, a renewable, renewable energy scheme, well, yeah, you can get a big business to come in and introduce a scheme where all the profit goes elsewhere, or we can use the models such as uh, Robin Hood Energy or Plymouth Energy Community, where we can cooperatively hold the uh, business owned by people in our community with the benefit coming back to our communities in terms of profit, in terms of uh, the utility from it. And that's an argument that can win back support. But for me, our biggest challenge in our rural communities is, is one of mindset. And as a party, we need to change our mindset. It just needs to move from one gear to another that says rural communities are part of us. Our connection with the land is important. You know, the Labour Party uh, and uh, our rural communities are not inseparably different. They need to be bonded together. We need to make the case that uh, we won't achieve social justice and justice around food unless we deal with poor agricultural workers' wages, unless we deal with the fact that public services in rural communities are often the poorest in the country, that coastal communities only have 180 degrees of growth potential because half of it's the sea. That's the challenge for us. And that is one where, you know, DEFRA policy areas need to be, frankly, much bolder. And that's why, for me, hopefully you won't be seeing me talking about the technicalities of DEFRA issues. You'll be speaking, you'll be hearing me talking about the values of those issues. And that will, I think, over time, if we empower and educate our members to listen, to turn up and listen to rural communities in particular, we can win support because actually those rural communities, well, they often agree with us. They agree with us on quite a lot. We just need to find an opportunity to help them, uh, help us and help them uh, uh, bring back uh, and reconnect. And if we can do that, we win. Great. Uh, thanks, Luke. And I mean, d d dealt with such ease with two. I'm, I'm going to increase to three questions in the bunches, if that's OK, Luke, because mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that we've got a, a, enough yeah, please, please, uh, please, time to, to bring others in. If we can keep our questions and answers a little bit more uh, 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 short. Uh, no. no thorn in the side loop to go back to that in <laughs> analogy in any way uh, but I, I will make, allow this to run on if that's all right with you a little bit longer just to make sure we bring in others but i i am conscious of where we're up to um we've had uh, questions in the in the chat and it's something you uh, touched on through your presentation in your speech loop uh, in terms of uh, councils uh, the importance of councils in, in this aspect and indeed much wider uh, both from sharon and from sean woodcock as well you you touched on cults of councils you touched on cults of councillors you know i think what sean's saying is we've got to be a bit bolder and and, and trust that, so that that devolution that local uh, decision making I'm, I'm guessing you're in the same place but I'll leave those two with you while I bring in uh, Bryony, uh, Bryony Rudkin. Uh, you're you're ne next in line with the handoff if we're able to unmute Bryony. Thank you, thank you. Hello Luke. Um, Hello. I, I'm Bryony from Ipswich. Um, obviously we met before. Um, I've spent the last few weeks um, dealing with Tudor and the issue of fish. He's become slightly obsessed with cooking fish, has he not? Um, I've learned more about um, food distribution and logistics chains than I ever knew when I and I spent six years on a regional development agency and I had to kind of reconnect with all the contacts I'd had with that in order to to try and get East Anglia involved in the call for fish thing that that's been doing so well in Plymouth and I just wondered what you thought about education if 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 people like me us don't understand what crazy food chains we have had hitherto how are we going to make that change? Because I think I think that's really, you know, uh, what you said about the person who thought that, you know, Labour not wanting food banks might be one end of people not understanding things. But, but you know, I I, I know more about fish than I ever knew before, um, uh, and and I want to know how I can just get other people to know about that. What are we going to do? 
thank you great stuff and and off the back of that Luke, the third one just coming in uh, from, from from the chat uh, is paul. paul paul's asking in terms of and you've touched uh, an awful lot upon uh labor's approach to the agriculture bill and so off the back of that i know uh, in the fisheries bill you were you were front and center making sure that uh, cooperatives within uh, fisheries were given that opportunity to grow and expand within the uh, fishery supply chain uh, uh, and also in the agriculture bill as well you you've called for doubling the size of the cooperative sector within agriculture that was a, the tenant of paul's question was are we doing enough to push uh, cooperative uh, supply within agriculture and uh, but it, that, that's the, the the essence of that second question and hopefully uh, paul luke's other comments in terms of agriculture cover some of the other aspects of, of your question as well luke on those three Great. Okay. Um, in terms of um, Sharon and Sean about trusting local councils, um, we've we've not only got to choose to do that, we have no choice but to do that. And um, the bonds that we need between local and national, I mean, the, the advantage of uh, being in Plymouth is that we're uh, so far away from the people in power that we, uh, we can pretty much innovate, do new things, uh, try and succeed, and doing stuff and then uh, share the best bits that we're good at but the disadvantage is that frequently those people in power won't really think of uh, Plymouth and other towns and cities around the country first and foremost with their developing policy and that needs to change uh, because our path back to power uh, comes from town halls and city halls um, I want it to come from parish councils and other uh, uh, tiers of government as well um, and part of that, we have to uh, listen and promote the innovation that's going on. I mean, the uh, Cooperative uh, Innovation Network uh, and the work that I know that Chris Benberthy, uh, one of the uh, Plymouth's Cooperative uh, Labour Councillors, does on it, um, you know, highlighting the fact that we've got amazing councils doing pretty amazing stuff. Well, we need to make sure that's not just held within those part, uh, councils that identify as cooperative. We need to make sure that it expands to those councils that identify as Labour and then the oppositions that identify as Labour to make sure that we are embracing that. And, you know, uh, that comes down to each of us not to be timid about it, because one of the things generalising about cooperative people and, and forgive me for generalising about everyone on the call is that we tend to be pretty nice folk. We tend to be easygoing, tend to be nice. You know, we need to be bolder. We need to be louder about what we're achieving. And if we're not, then we, we only have ourselves to blame when others aren't listening to us about it. Uh, so that is a call to arms for all of us to, you know, speak up about what we are doing. Um, and when it comes to fish, um, so before I was uh, promoted, I was the shadow fisheries minister. Uh, I looked after everything wet in the Labour Party, fisheries, flooding and water policy. And I loved it. Um, there's a thousand jobs in Plymouth in fishing. And... Um, Frequently, the debate around fishing has been captured by the right wing, by those that regard uh, fishers as, you know, the, the, the victims of the European Union, the, the, the ones that will be freed and, and able to succeed without it. Well, do you know what? Labour needs to be the party of fishing, because when it comes down to it, the detailed policy that we present versus the Tories, well, we're better for fishers, better for those coastal communities than the Tories are. But there's a big gap between that. And that's where, you know, we need to get better at it. And, you know, there's a huge amount of cooperation in the fishery sector and in agriculture. You know, the co-op uh, group may have sold its farms. Uh, and so, you know, it previously was the biggest, the nation's biggest farmer, no longer is the case. And, you know, you and I may have views about whether that was the right decision, but it was a decision that was taken. Well, that doesn't mean that cooperation is not there. Cooperation is alive and well. You know, the amount of farmers pulling together to uh, hold cooperatives and mutuals is, is, is incredible. Uh, one of the things we need to talk about is we need to recognise that it exists. We're not introducing a concept to rural or fishing communities. We're, we're saying, you're already doing this. You're already really good at this. You get this. And then we want to help you grow it further, because I think the objective of doubling the size of the co-op economy was a good one in the manifesto. Well, we didn't win the election. But why does that mean that that objective needs to go? Let's try and double the size of the cooperative economy from opposition. Let's create and support those cooperatives that are growing, that has the potential to replace stuff. Let's not immediately reach for a private sector-led solution. Let's try and look at where there's a mutual solution uh, that helps along the way. So I think we should do it. Um, in relation to uh, Bryony, um, uh, some of you uh, may uh, know that the leader of Plymouth City Council is a fantastic uh, co-op councillor called Tudor Evans. Uh, quite a quite a uh, uh, quite a character, 
and uh, he has been at the uh, promotional front of this amazing initiative called Call for Fish, uh, which is uh, at the heart of it a really, really simple concept. That is because we export the majority of the fish we catch in Britain and we import the majority of the fish we eat, at this moment, with export markets closed and severely restricted, our fishers aren't able in many cases to make ends meet. And because restaurants and cafes are closed, their domestic markets are really suffering. So Call for Fish is a brilliant website, callforfish.com, uh, uh, and the four is a number. Um, go there, ring up your local fishmonger, local fisheries company, order some fish. It is as brilliant and simple as that. And that is now being rolled out nationwide. And, you know, for me, it, it helps expose um, the, the fact that... Uh, uh, food policy in the widest sense needs to be brought to the fore because it is a nonsense that quite a lot of the fish we actually eat we catch here we export to china for processing and then we import back from china now you will think of that as bonkers that's the way large bits of our markets work we don't catch the fish on our doorstep we buy fish from further afield we don't eat the food that we grow locally, we export it. As a country, we're dependent on food imports. We don't have a great sense of self-sufficiency. We are building in carbon into our food supply sector and our diets are becoming accustomed to that. Well, in the era of a climate emergency, that does seem to change. So we do need to you know, really grapple with those areas. But for me, the fundamental one is that fishing and farming for the last five years have become an identity issue. They're not about fishing and farming. No one's really sitting there going, let me tell you, a detailed conversation about the three crop rule and why that's wrong in farm subsidy. No one's saying that. What they're saying is we want back our British farmers. Well, do you know what? I want Labour's policy to be front and centre, relentlessly patriotic. We back our British farmers too. We want to help them decarbonise. We want to help them to pay better wages for their workers. We want them to open new markets in our country for locally grown food. The same with our fishers. And when we take that approach, that's not a radical one, that's simply shifting gear that says, why should the right have fishing and farming as their natural habitats? Why should we have exited that part of our country? We shouldn't have. And that is my intent to make sure that uh, those rural and coastal communities know that Labour uh, has a policy that will work for them. And we are there alongside them fighting the same fights and listening to them. If we do that, then we're in a better chance of winning those communities back. Thank, thanks, Luke. I, I recognise we're in uh, danger of going into extra time now, Luke. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll ask uh, our contributors to be as short, as, uh, as snappy, as perfectly possible in, in yourself as well. Uh, Jim, I see that you're asking in terms of trade deals. I think uh, Luke really uh, covered that ever so, ever so well earlier on with Jenny. If you did miss that content, remember it's up on uh, YouTube after 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 this so you, you'll be able to catch up um i'm going to bring in uh, rachel blake now in a second so if we're able to un unmute rachel and just while i'm doing it david smith has asked uh in terms of you touched on it in your uh, introduction in terms of uh, food boxes food parcels uh, coming from some of you talked talked about angel delight and some of the thing the, the the stories that we've seen over the last few weeks uh, David's just asking for a comment in and around that, that, that those schemes and also whether there's a need for national food services, more grassroots uh, alternatives as well. Uh, so uh, on, on that, I'll bring in Rachel and then we'll have one more in this bunch. Rachel? Um, yeah, uh, good evening. I'm Rachel Blake, Deputy Mayor in the London Borough of Tower Hamlets and it is about this food supply. Our experience of the national food scheme to the shielded has been really, really worrying. It's not just in terms of content, but in terms of coverage. And I suppose that you've talked a bit about national attitudes to local government, but I wanted to ask what we really need to do to unpick this default mentality that why on earth did DEFRA think that they could possibly get all these food parcels out in the first place if they had any real understanding of how things work they wouldn't have thought they could and I wondered how uh, how we as a Labour Party can make that case and highlight that it was never going to work in the first place. Okay that's great and the last one in this section is uh, Natan. Uh, new, new... Are you there, Newton? Yes, Modi? I am. Yeah, yes. there we go. Are you there? Thank you. Uh, it's Newton Modi, Southern Eastern Society Party Council. Um, just interested in um, Luke's last point about food banks and people not um, realising that there is an alternative uh, to food banks in their lives um, if they voted for Labour. 
So what does Labour intend to do uh, to move away from the whole of the mentality of food banks? Because I live in an urban environment and I see so many people dependent on this provision. Um, what, what's the policy? That's great. And we're sort of moving towards uh, the uh, uh, vulnerable uh, uh, people, members of our communities. Uh, what I would throw in there, Lou, just any comment, and it's come in through the chat in a couple of places, comment in terms of uh, so vulnerable members of our communities, again, but disabled customers, who is DEFRA doing enough thinking in terms of making sure everyone is able to access uh, food supply here and now? Uh, Lou, it, over to you. Uh, these are great questions. Thank you. Uh, just to run through them, uh, Jim, on trade deals, um, I've already sat down with Emily Thornbury, albeit virtually, uh, to talk about our position on trade deals, because the lack of parliamentary scrutiny on trade deals that the government is proposing in the trade bill basically means that unless we get our, um, our lines agreed now, unless we get our red lines clear and in legislation, the government will be able to rip up trade deals, will be able to uh, will basically introduce whatever standards or non-standards they like in the future, and the opportunity to scrutinise, to amend, to challenge that uh, will be you know, virtually nil. So we need to make sure that in this period we are not allowing the government uh, a free hand with trade deals. We need to maintain parliamentary scrutiny of it, and we need to make sure that we are putting front and centre our values as a country, and that is uh, making sure that our high environmental and animal welfare values aren't able to be undercut or eroded or challenged in the court of law uh, uh, by anyone that we're doing trade deals with. Um, um, the questions around food boxes and alternative food banks, I'll take all those together if I can. Now, I'm a big fan of butterscotch angel delight. I think it is uh, an incredible innovation. And as someone who's lactose intolerant, uh, angel delight is somewhat of a challenge for me by putting milk in it, but it is, uh, it is pretty nice. But it's not a nutritious part of a meal. And the real problem we've got with DEFRA's approach here is that they, uh, as a first decision, they decide to um, go over the heads of local councils. They decided to negate the, uh, uh, the expertise, the experience, the networks that local councils, both Labour and Conservative, have, their knowledge of those communities. The private sector-led solution in terms of the uh, parcels, I think, was a poor decision, first of all. But now they've made that, we need to make sure that they understand just how important and significant local government can be in providing different solutions in the future. Now, the shielded population will frankly be shielded for some time to come. And I would like to see a greater level of honesty from ministers around, around what the plan is for those people who are shielded. Because, you know, unless there's a vaccine, the need, the, the need to supply them with decent food, public services, health care, befriending services, social connection is going to continue for quite some time. And that has to involve local councils. It absolutely does need to be in there as well. So they do need to look again at that. And I think that's a case that's been made very powerfully by the local government association and by, uh, in particular, Labour councils uh, along the way. Um, when it comes to the uh, access for disabled people, the way the government's uh, approached this is that if you are in the one and a half million, that's a shielded population, i.e. Uh, coronavirus makes you medically vulnerable uh, and your personal circumstances makes you medically vulnerable, then you are being supported or giving in the, being given the option of support. Well, that may be right and proper for those, uh, those areas there. And I think there's certainly critiques and improvements we'd like to see there, although broadly that is an approach that we back. Well, the eight million people that are in the uh, non-shielded vulnerable category as the government describes it well that includes an awful lot of people which you and I would regard as vulnerable who are worthy and deserving of support and attention from policymakers and governments if I just take one example of that blind people as an example if you are blind you are no more likely to get coronavirus as someone without a visual impairment but if you are trying to food shop when you are blind your guide dog hasn't been trained in social distancing. You have to touch more of your environment to be able to understand it more. Therefore, you are more prone to uh, being, uh, being get it. It doesn't make you any more medically vulnerable. It just makes your circumstances are. So I want to see the government instruct supermarkets to include blind people as part of their, um, uh, their online delivery prioritization, as part of a, a different set of this. Now, that's not happening. Some supermarkets are making good steps forward. And some of that is store by store, not just chain by chain. But 
That haphazard approach means that if you live on one side of a road, you could be getting a very different service if you live on the other side of the road simply by your geography, and that's not right. So that's the kind of critique that we're, we're pushing on to uh, ministers to say, look, there's areas to be improved, and we're working with Marsha Dickold over the uh, new Shadow Secretary of State for Women and Equalities to make that case in particular about disability groups. But I want to see a greater focus on what's in a food box, um, uh, how much that costs, uh, where the best delivery mechanism for it is, and I think the debate around the National Food Service is an interesting one uh, that was highlighted in particular by Rebecca during the uh, leadership contest. Um, in my mind, we need to eradicate the need for food banks. We do that by uh, setting a clear timetable. We would have done that within our, a half food bank use in the first year of a Labour government in our manifesto. But we do that by, in particular, addressing poverty, because it is poverty that's driving food bank use, not just the lack of food. And that has to be uh, how we approach this. And that's why uh, so much of the way that we deal with food poverty during the virus is about how we deal with universal credit, how we deal with housing allowance, uh, and how we deal with uh, low wages and uh, those people who haven't been furloughed or on a support scheme. That's great. Um, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and wrap it up all after the next set of uh, questions. It, you, you've triggered such a lively debate within uh, the, the, the chat here, Luke, um, you know, there's people talking about their own co community uh, responses to what we're, community fridges bringing up, Ben's talking about. Also, there's some discussion in terms of uh, migrant workers, uh, uh, farm labour and supply, some of the things that you touched on uh, already. So rather than go back towards some of those aspects, I'm going to bring in three people who've had, uh, have, had their hand up uh, for, for a little while. We'll take those and we'll see where we get to. But if, uh, again, just an appeal for brevity uh, from me, uh, uh, but also from the questionnaires uh, and Luke, uh, we can get the through. Tony first, Tony Wolf. I, <coughs> sorry, do I have to push? No, you on, Tony, just speak. You yeah, ah, right, right. Um, my uh, question is fairly straightforward, is would not uh, a UBI, Universal Basic Income, have made a lot of difference in this coronavirus issue? But also, in general, it seems to be something which is very much coming to the fore. I've seen articles recently about it. What is your views on, on that? Um, oh, just Sorry, one extra bit on it is that figures that I saw, <clears throat> it wouldn't be costly if it was for a family of four, two children, two adults. It would be roughly £10,000 a year. Okay, totally. And then... the cost of it would be virtually similar to what Social Security and all, all the other benefits were paid in 2010 when the Tories came into power. Okay, thanks, Sony. Uh, we've got Duncan, uh, and after that, Ben. I, I referenced the community fridge. If you still want to to come in, keep your hand up, and, and you'll be next. But first up, Duncan. Um, yes, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I especially admire Portsmouth because it has a good mental health cooperative working there. And even during this time, it continues to be in dialogue with people because obviously the major problem we're going to be facing in this country with the largest number of deaths in Europe is the problem of the mental health burden of bereavement. And what we need is to have organizations such as the Good Mental Health Cooperative where a sense of empowerment is shared between the people seeking help. So a cooperative vision rather than one which has come under tremendous strain during this time, and that's the, the top-down professional approach. Do you think in some way the Labour Party could try and help support uh, these start-up movements, which I think are beginning to become evident in the country? Great. Thanks, Duncan. And I, I believe that Luke has been passing around five five pounds to uh, participants ahead of me coming into the room to get all of this uh, 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 Plymouth content into this hour. Uh, but yeah, fantastic question. Thanks, Duncan. And Ben, you've kept your hand up, so we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. take Ben uh, as well. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, how are we supposed to move forwards with any of our campaigns um, as, as a, someone in local government? We don't get supported at town council level because Within the Labour umbrella, you kind of get forgotten. It, it, you get an automatic email saying, sorry, you lost your election when you actually won your election. But for, uh, for, I say, unless you're in one of the higher two tiers, which is district or county, they kind of just forget about you. But we're actually doing some of the harder work. 
especially in Sussex. I, I live um, in Wilden, so right in the heart of East Sussex. Our council, uh, Wilden, is really poor. Um, it's a conservative-run uh, council. So at local council level and parish council level, we're trying to keep ourselves afloat around what the big cuts are coming through through, um, through our district and county council. So I was just wondering how you feel that Labour's going to move forward with the CART party. Like I say, we're doing things within the community and looking at the third sector now because we know that we're not going to get any more funding. So how are we going to get the two connected again? Because I think there's a mismatch. Great stuff. Thanks, Ben. And uh, there's one last uh, question in, and it, I, I will take it. Michael, Michael Kane, if you'd like to come in. Uh, Michael, we will just take your question as well, if that's okay. Michael Kane. If not, we're going to go to we're going to go to those questions. Michael has put down his hand. Uh, so, Luke, uh, on, those, on those three and any concluding points as well, please. Let's try that. Um, OK, um, I'd say, Ben, um, I have not always been supportive of the approach taken by regional offices or headquarters to those in the regions. And I have, at times before uh, my current role, been known to be somewhat argumentative about the organisation oh. of where resources go. Uh, <laughs> as a good boy in the shadow cabinet now, I will be supportive of our approach, which I will be quite gobby behind the scenes to make sure reflects the need for us to have a uh, growth of labour representation everywhere. Now, of course, there'll be prioritisation within it. And I think what we have to do is build both a broad base, uh, but then have areas where we grow and have a Labour Party uh, administrative organisational setup that values local government and resources accordingly to deliver Labour gains. And I think, you know, I, I, Plymouth is a, is a marginal council. We have marginal parliamentary seats. Uh, we are only a couple of councillors at any point from losing power. That, that breeds a mentality and an approach which is different than the seats where we always win or seats where we always lose. Uh, we need to listen to all different types of representation across the board to make sure that we're supporting them. A good training offer, a good campaign offer, a good mention of local councils when you're uh, uh, labour in local government when you're doing stuff. I think all of that breeds it. And if I'm honest, the new um, the new setup that we'll have in party headquarters with a new general secretary, um, you know, has to be used as an opportunity to reshape uh, some of that. Uh, focus. That's what Keir's spoken about in particular. That's what Angela's spoken about. And I'm really excited about some of her proposals around uh, her campaigning uh, uh, approach and uh, how she wants to reform some of the, the party structures. So I think you've got some friends there. Um, Duncan, um, mental health has been in crisis for far too long and we will need to find ways of addressing that in a much more comprehensive way coming out of this. I'm really, um, really pleased that uh, Rosanna Allen Khan, who I think had a pretty exceptional uh, leadership contest uh, when she was running for deputy leader, uh, is now in the mental health role, putting the case for mental health in a you know, quite direct way. Um, I think that's really positive because we need to make sure that mental health isn't, um, isn't regarded as a... The risk here is that um, uh, acute hospital care, uh, social care, takes the lion's share of political attention with the virus. And that means primary care um, and uh, mental health is sidelined from it. We've also seen resources for vi from the virus response of uh, diversify or moving resources from mental health to some of those other frontline services. Now, in a crisis, you do all you can, but that's not a long term solution to where we need to be. And we need to resource mental health properly. We need to make sure that we're supporting it. And there needs to be better support in the community and approaches to it. But what we can't see is frequently what happens around healthcare co-ops is that there is a healthcare co-op built, a service that's commissioned from cooperatives, uh, from local communities. And when it comes to recommissioning that service, uh, the rules of that recommissioning are built in such a way that cooperatives can't uh, possibly bid for it, would never win. So you have a first entry of a cooperative provision, but that is eroded and just given over to Virgin um, Care at the end of it because of their requirement for debt ratios or something like that on it. So we have to be alive to that along the way. Uh, Tony, when it comes to UBI, um, so I'm, I'm, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity to explore some uh, different areas here. Um, I support where Annalise Dodds has got to on UBI that it wasn't appropriate to call for the introduction of a whole new benefit system as an emergency response to provide immediate support. I get that. As someone who favours radical policy solutions and want to see us uh, explore some of these areas more, I get where she's coming from. 
because what we need to do as a movement, and this is a good lesson for us, I think, is not just adopt some of, the, uh, some of those ideas. We have to sell those ideas. We have to build support behind those radical ideas. So when they're proposed, there is support within the public. There's, there's people lined up behind it. Because if not, then we, we become risk of being, um, of being people who can say they were right, but are never in power or listened to by everyone else. And frankly, that's not a place that delivers the change that we need. It doesn't deliver a UBI. It doesn't deliver an end to food banks. And that's where we have to make sure we're building the case for it. And I think there is, you know, uh, within our broad movement now, I think there is an understanding from Keir to party members that actually we want a radical policy solution. You know, Keir favours radical policies. We need to make sure that behind each and every one of those radical policies, there's an evidence base, there's a properly thought through plan, and that we've taken the time to listen to those communities for whom that will have the biggest impact to win their support. Now, that's a lot of work, frankly. It's a lot of task, but it's necessary task because without it, we don't win. And so that is where our campaign model, our organizational approach will have to change. But we're the largest party in Western Europe. We have uh, members in every single constituency, in every single community, well, that is an amazing untapped potential if we use it in that way. And that's one of the reasons why over the next few months, myself and the rest of the Shadow DEFRA team, uh, when the lockdown lifts, we'll be out in communities listening to members. I, I want to be doing more of these Zoom calls uh, um, um, with different groups. And, you know, it's great that the Co-op Party is bound to host today to listen to people's opinions, to look at how we get into the weeds of some of those areas, because we're not going to win back the seats we lost if we don't turn up. We have to show up to the community meetings, to the council meetings, on the ballot paper, on people's doors. We have to show up. We have to listen, first of all. And I think as a party, um, I'll leave you with this thought about how we do that. Uh, it's always a good place to remember uh, that we come equipped uh, with two ears and one mouth. And we should use them in that proportion of listening more than we speak. And uh, I've done the opposite today and talking lots but hopefully you'll take that into how you communicate in your communities that as a party we should listen more and we should speak less that will make us stronger and better uh, and more likely to be in power uh, as a result that's great Th thanks luke um uh, look thank you for showing up tonight thank everyone on the call uh, for showing up tonight it's been such an interesting and wide-ranging discussion and i feel that there's many more hours to come there, there is a facility obviously to keep your questions coming through uh, through the email to ourselves we'll we'll feed it into to luke and the team get keep that conversation going there'll be plenty of opportunities to speak uh, with luke as one of our nine labor and cooperative members of that uh, exciting shadow cabinet that luke describes uh, thank you for your time uh, Luke and thank you for your time it leaves me just to give one last advert uh, for tomorrow tomorrow lunchtime corporation live uh, we have Mieta Fambula a great uh, friend of the cooperative party chief executive of the new economic foundation NEF and uh, looking at what sort of economy we can build post this crisis really interesting discussion uh, I think some of the same themes uh, will be picked up on uh, from this call today so thank you very much have a wonderful evening stay safe and, uh, and best wishes from the cooperative party thanks very much bye bye now bye bye see you soon bye